All right, in the last lecture, we looked at trying to get a feel for what a normal distribution is, where it comes from. So make sure you remember that a normal distribution is described by two things. It's average, it's mean, and a standard deviation, which is a common distance that the items that you're describing by the distribution, it's a common distance those items are away from the average. And so if you go one of those common distances above and below the average, you capture 68.26% of whatever it is you're describing. It could be data, it could be something else. So it could be totals of numbers as we saw last time. And the central limit theorem says, again, if you add up totals, uh, add up independently generated random numbers, the resulting totals will follow one of these normal distributions. Now, uh, the law of large numbers is sometimes confused with this central limit theorem. The central limit theorem just says, tells us the shape of a distribution will be normal if you have a large sample size and you add things up. Now, this is also true, the central limit theorem, if you average things. Why? Because what's the first step in taking an average? It's adding the numbers up. So it's not the averaging that makes it a normal distribution, it is the adding part. So the law of large numbers looks at the dividing part, really. The law of large numbers says that if we take a sample of data and we estimate a sample average or a sample proportion or a sample slope or a sample variance or a sample whatever, then the sample estimate will probably, not definitely, but probably get closer to the true value of the thing we're estimating. The true population mean, population proportion, the real slope of the relationship, etc. as the sample size increases. So the law of large numbers basically says larger sample size makes our estimates more accurate. The central limit theorem does not say this. The central limit theorem says that in some cases, uh, larger sample size means that your estimates will follow a normal distribution if you're talking about adding things up or averaging them. Okay? So, why is it that the law of large numbers says this? Well, in the simplest case, think about those totals. When you add up n numbers, the standard deviation of the total will have a standard deviation of the square root of n times the standard deviation of the individual things you're adding up. But when you divide that uh, total by n to get the average, the standard deviation of the average is going to be the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we call this standard deviation divided by the square root of n the standard error. And the standard error is a standard deviation. But we call it a different term, a standard error, because a standard deviation tells us a common distance that data normally, this is the way I think about it, a common distance that data is from the average of the data. A standard error tells us a common distance that a sample estimate is away from the truth, away from the parameter that you're estimating. So you have standard errors for means, and that gives you a common distance your average will be from the population mean that it came from. Uh, a sample average away from the population average. A standard error for a proportion is a common distance that a sample proportion will be from the real proportion. So if I take a coin and I flip it 20 times, we can calculate the standard error for the proportion. Uh, there's also standard errors for slopes. So let, let's go ahead and look at these standard errors. This is a good time to go ahead and look at these. In any statistics class you study, the standard error for a proportion is calculated as the square root of p times 1 minus p on the top divided by the square root of n on the bottom. What does this mean? Ceteris paribus, as the sample size gets bigger, the standard error goes down because, the, because of that square root of n on the bottom. What does that mean? 
Well, the standard error is the common distance. An estimate is from the truth. An estimate is from the underlying parameter. And so the bigger the sample size, the closer that estimate will be, probably be, right? The smaller that common distance will be between the estimate and the truth. Now, here's a standard error for the mean we were just looking at. The standard deviation of the data you're studying divided by the square root of n. And I just rewrote, well, how do you calculate that standard deviation on the top? Um, sum of the xi is minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1. Square root of that gives you the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And Now, this is the same basic formula, the same basic process for calculating both of these. The square root of p times 1 minus p is the standard deviation for a binomial process. And the standard deviation for continuous data is given by s. So we're just dividing by the square root of n. Now for slopes, let's look at this formula for the standard error for a slope because this is the key calculation when we're talking about inference for a regression. Now this is a formula for if there are two explanatory variables, what is the formula for how, that, how large that common distance is that between our estimate of the slope and the true slope that we're estimating. There are four parts to this formula to me. The first, look at the top here, the sum of the squared residuals, but the square root of that, right? So part A on the top says that the bigger our residuals are, the larger the common distance will be between the estimate of our slope and the true slope kind of makes sense that if our line doesn't fit the data very well, then uh, our confidence in how close our estimate of the slope is to the truth is going to be lower. So bigger residuals, the larger the di common distance will be between our estimate and the true slope. Now let's look at part B down here on the left. This is basically, uh, so this is the variance of the estimate for the first slope. So we have two variables, uh, horsepower and um, gas mileage. So this is the standard error for horsepower. This part says that it depends on the sum of the observations for horsepower minus the mean of horsepower squared. This is basically the first part of calculating the variance of horsepower. So since this is on the bottom, it basically says, part B is, that the larger the variance of the observations of horsepower are, the smaller the standard error of your slopes are going to be. Think about a scatter plot. The, the wider the range of observations you have, then the more confident you're going to be in the slope. Let me draw a picture of that real quickly. Okay, I've drawn some data points here, hypothetical data points, that have a very low variance in their x value here. And so, what, looking at these pink points, what is the best line that fits those points? Well, answer, we have no idea because, you know, it could be pretty much anything. I mean, it could be, uh, you know, a low you know, kind of a positive slope, right? I could just as easily see a, a negative slope going through those points or, or maybe a, a flat line going through those points. So this is just saying that we don't have any confidence in our estimate of a slope if all of our points are piled up at the same x value. However, if we um, had some points way far away from each other, then we can easily see where the line has got to go. It's got to go through those points on that end, and it's got to go through those points on that end. And so the more variation you have in your x values, it's not the y values, but the x values, the higher the variance of your x values, the more confident we can be that we really know what that slope is. So that's what that part of the formula means. Part C, this middle part down here, this 
R squared 1, 2. This is the correlation coefficient between the two explanatory variables. This is looking at multicollinearity, which is uh, having a high degree of correlation between the variables, the explanatory variable. And so if this correlation coefficient is high, close to 1 or minus 1, because it's squared here, then this part of the formula in the middle becomes close to 0, then the denominator of this whole equation gets close to 0, and as the denominator gets close to 0, the standard error gets higher. And so an important thing to keep in mind, if you have a high standard error, it could be because some of your explanatory variables are highly correlated with each other. And then lastly, degrees of freedom. n minus k, in this case two explanatory variables minus 1, the larger the sample size, ceteris paribus, that will make your standard error go down.